The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 35 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the um, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, it's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, But yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. To recap, we are now into And Another Thing, which is the sixth book of three in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. Uh, And it is the book, the final book, that was penned by uh, Owen Colfer um, uh, with the um, support of uh, Douglas Adams' widow, when, as I mentioned last week, when he finished Mostly Harmless, uh, Douglas Adams um, made comment uh, along the lines that he was, he saw there being a sixth book in the series because actually Mostly Harmless is actually, it was brilliant, it's also quite bleak. Um, and he wanted to leave the whole thing with more of an uplift at the end of it than than people got with uh, with mostly harmless, um, and unfortunately, of course, tragically, um, uh, the way things w- worked out, uh, we lost um, Douglas, uh, and and he never got around to penning that. But Owen Colfer came up with some great stuff in in conjunction with Dirk Mags, who was a long time producer of the radio series, uh, and. Um, came up with what we're working on at the moment. So we have to recap. We have reached a point where uh, we are beginning to unpick um, some strangeness. All of the lead characters that we're familiar with are there, apart from so far the uh, the appearance of Zaphod. Um, but there's something very weird going on in the whole sort of general mishmash, uh, and we're not entirely sure, but it seems that they the the characters are caught in some kind of stasis whether it's a real one whether it's an improbability thing we don't know uh, and by the way for all of you listening this is the first time i've read this book myself as well i've heard the radio series but i've not read the book so i'm not entirely familiar with 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 where we're going to go with the book because the books do tend to be a bit more detailed so this is a, this is a, as exciting for me as it is for you so great there hello jean defu Uh, Welcome along. Um, Let's crack on. So we've uh, had the first chapter and now we're into the second chapter of And Another Thing. Chapter two. Oh, as always, of course, D. Oh, God almighty. T. 
tea sound, tea drinking sound effects there. I do love tea so much. Okay. Right. Ford Prefect explored the room of sky, breathing on the walls to see if the surface fogged, pulling horrible faces to check for a recoil factor, and eventually touching it gingerly through his sleeve. When the material of his shirt did not have its electrons excited to a higher temperature, Ford deemed it safe to poke the wall with his finger. He did so, and the wall rippled, sending images of Flebu's wedding ceremonies, beach huts and wild parties flitting across the room. When the ripples died, so did the residual memories, and the wall was azure sky once more. "'Do you mind?' said a voice that seemed to come from everywhere. "'My needles are on red as it is, to coin an archaic phrase. "'If you could just sit still, I can hold this construct together a while longer.' "'So you're saying that this whole room is a construct,' said Ford, poking the wall again. "'Would you—' "'Didn't I just—' "'Yes, yes, it's a construct. "'This waiting lounge is all in your head, in all of your heads. "'It is a virtual room. "'Is there another way you would like me to impart this information?' Ford scratched his chin, and was disappointed to find that it was not as chiselled as it had been at Han Wavell. How about a video? The sky walls disappeared altogether, replaced by several representations of, ro of a robotic bird tapping a claw impatiently. "'Ah,' said Ford, "'the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Mark II.' I thought as much. I haven't seen you since. Ford flipped through his solidifying memories. Since you tried to get the earth blasted to pieces. Not since then, said the bird. Not since way back then, imagine. You've upgraded your feathers to gold, I see. It's a construct, Beetlejuzian. I appear as I wish to appear. So did you back at the resort. "'Remember the chin?' Ford sighed wistfully. "'I do. I was so fruity. Those shadows I could cast with that godlike... So shadows I could cast with that godlike chin.' "'I've seen a few gods,' remarked the bird. "'Some of them are not so great in the chin department. Why do you think Loki cultivates that... Loki cultivates that beard?' Ford paced a little. Back to my question. How about a video? H2G22 scowled, which is not easy with a beak. Didn't you hear me? Needles are on red. I can't hold the waiting lounge together for much longer. Nothing fancy, just some 2D animation, old school stuff. I know you can do it if you really want to. The bird rolled its eyes dramatically, and then disappeared from one of the walls. In its place a black screen opened, and on the screen were four neon stick figures. One had a rather outlandish boob circles, and another hadn't, had, hadn't, hadn't much in the way of chins. Ha ha ha! called Ford scornfully to the sky. Very humorous! A cartoon bird appeared on the screen and hovered above the four humanoids. Welcome, said the bird, to this video demonstration, which I like to call Constructs for Idiots. Ford raised a finger. Does that mean that the people in the constructs are idiots, or that you're explaining it to idiots? The bird ignored him. As a pan-dimensional, mega-advanced, omniscient travel guide equipped with the very best organo-brain capable of running over ten trillion simultaneous calculations, Ford rapped on the screen. Could you keep it down and hurry it up? I feel pretty sure that there is bad news coming, and it might be better if I get to grips with it first. Some people in this room don't handle bad news so well. I'd like to have a chance to massage the truth a little before I present it. Well, if you'd stop wittering on... I am stopped. Go ahead, please. The bird cleared its throat in a wholly unnecessary manner. As I was saying, 
As such an advanced biohybrid organism, it was a simple matter for me to poke a neuron beam into the dream centre at the back of each brain. Yours was a little hard to find, by the way, Betelgeusean. And then link the neural networks through a central server. That is to say, myself. Ford frowned. Show me some moving pictures, he said. On-screen blue beams fanned from the bird's wingtips, entering the humanoid's heads through one ear, then exiting through the other ear and converging onto the H2G22's forehead. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy 2. H2G22. So you sent us to sleep and gave us a dream. I gave you life for a long time, but it was virtual life. We didn't go anywhere? Correct. Anywhere or any when. Which is not a word. Organobrain? Really? I was trying to be succinct. Ford poked the wall again, this time with two fingers, watching the memory ripples run around the walls and intermingle. It's all just a dream, then, and not just this room. No, said the voice, coolly. Not just this room. More poking. How far back? Club Beta. Club Beta, that bongs a gong for some reason. Club Dingly Dangly Beta. Ford stopped pacing. Holy shank worsters! I will thank you, said the Hitchhiker's Guide Mark II, to mind your language. I am fully programmed to take offence. Aren't we all? Guide note. This is literally true of the Cyphrols of Sassafras Magna, a gas giant in the Pleiades system. The Cyphrols are tiny invertebrate free-swimming gastrozoa who absorb the hostile energy emitted by their predators and use it to power their own systems. This makes the predators angry, and so the Cyphrols swim faster through the gas ocean. Sassafras Magna gas dragons have learned to approach the Cyphrols casually, whistling a little tune or pretending to search for a few coins they've mislaid. The Cyphrols always fall for these tricks, as nature gave them large energy filters and tiny bullshit detectors. Ford's memory was still a little hazy. Club Beta, in, in London, but that was... Uh, I have no idea how long ago that was. It was then and is now. My perception is unfiltered, so I see all points of my existence simultaneously. OK, how about us impoverished beings with filtered perceptions? Ford didn't like this bird much, and believed that he would like it even less with a few... and He wouldn't even like it with a few gargle blasters eating at his stomach lining. You are still in the club. No time has passed. Ford grabbed clumps of his ginger hair. Why? For Zark's sake, why? Mark II rolled its pixelated eyes. You try to do someone a favour. Honestly. Favour? spluttered Ford, not giving a damn who heard. If you wanted to do us a favour, you could have transported us away from the exploding planet. That would have been in direct contradiction with my programme. I have prolonged your life by several decades. Who asked you to? Not me. Random Dent made the request. She is my secondary master. When the human miner realised that the entire planet was about to be destroyed, she expressed regret that she had not been allowed to live her life as she would have wished. Granting that wish did not conflict with my primary detect directive. Primary detective. Mong. <laughs> Granting that wish did not conflict with my primary directive. What about the rest of us? Mistress Dent included her parents and their chinless, dim-witted friend in her thoughts. Ford was wounded. Chinless? She thought that? Oh, yes, said the bird, with obvious relish, several times. Something occurred to Ford. Secondary master? Who is the primary? You are not entitled to interrogate me, 
snapped Mark II. Ford borrowed a tactic borrowed a tactic from the Sassafras Magna gas dragons. Oh, I know that. Of course, a wondrous being like yourself doesn't have to answer to a lowly Beetlejuicean like myself, but it would be lovely treat for me to understand the complexities of your plan. The bird cocked its head. I know what you're doing. Obviously. I experience every moment simultaneously. No point arguing, then, is there? You already know what you're going to do. Good point. Very well. The Vogons created me so that I could cajole you back to Earth before the Grebulons destroyed it. Which is happening now. Now, as you know it, yes. Will we be rescued? Probably not. So you gave us the lives we wanted? No, I gave you free will and a construct. You followed your own paths under my supervision. Ford winked at the bird. I get it. I see now. You wanted to experience real time. Mark II dropped its beak slowly, crossing its wings across its breast. I lived your lives with you, never knowing what was coming next. It was exhilaratingly random. And now? Now I know exactly what happens. A hundred years of maintaining four universes has depleted my power source. I only lasted this long because I periodically combined two constructs for the past virtual twenty years. Perhaps I should have thought of that sooner. But linear time is so immediate. In five virtual minutes this room will disappear and you will be left on Earth facing the planet-killer beams of the Grebulons. Ford's throat was suddenly too dry, and his thoughts too cohesive. How he missed cocktail hour. Five minutes. And counting, said Mark II, fading from view. In the places where the bird had been, there appeared several digital readouts, which said 457 and then 456. You get the picture. "'Humans think digital watches are pretty neat,' murmured Ford absently, and then turned to face the three humans, who were busy doing their utmost to avoid being the least bit civil to each other. The old man wasn't as ancient as he had been barely a moment before. He could tell this by the tautness of the skin on his hands and the renewed sharpness of his hearing.' I can hear every word these two women shriek at me. Oh, joy! Arthur yelled the elder of the two. Actually, sorry, Arthur yelled the elder of the two. What? Okay. Arthur yelled the elder of the two. Actually yelled. He hadn't been yelled at in decades. Are you even listening to me? Trying not to, thought Arthur, keeping his head down. "'I hate her!' screamed the teenager. "'She abandoned me, and now she wants to control me. "'How does that make sense?' "'Arthur? Daddy? "'I am speaking to you, Arthur Dent.' "'Arthur Dent. It fit him. It was him.' "'Arthur Dent,' mumbled Arthur Dent, "'and he wasn't happy to hear it. Is that all you have to say after all these years? I'm an old man, said Arthur, hopefully. Leave me alone. Old? said the woman. What are you talking about, old? You look exactly the same as you did the last time I saw you. Exactly. How did you do that? It was as Arthur feared. All those years alone on his beach, and now he was back in the universe with people shouting at him, and no idea what was going on. How did I do what? Stay so young. I'm younger than you, and I look like a silicon implant after a night in the toaster. Oh, why did I bother with all these refits? I should have retired, or brought random along with me, or other parents do it. Arthur resigned himself to the fact that there was no wishing himself back to the beach, and made eye contact. He saw a slim darkish young woman, with shoulder-length curling black hair and chocolate eyes, wearing a dark, shimmering trouser suit. 
memories poked through to his consciousness. Trillian, you look beautiful. The brown eyes blinked. Screw you, Arthur, I didn't come here to be patronised. Sorry, um, you look beautiful, miss. Arthur, I chose Zaphod at the party, so I live with it and drop that torch you're carrying. You need to see me as I am, my foot buzzes, for heaven's sake. Does it really? I didn't notice, and I would notice, because my hearing has become pretty sharp just recently. Trillian placed two fingers on her left tibia, searching for the vibration that generally thrummed along her shin bone, keeping her awake at night. No buzzing. Mother said random behind her. Mum! Trillian noticed her fingernails were all her own, no acrylic falses. I am young, well, youngish. How can this be? Time's running backwards. Mum! Just a minute, random. Tickle your bloody yo-yo or something. Fertile is gone, Mum, and I'm no one again. Trillian realised the enormity of what had happened and rushed to comfort her daughter. It's OK, darling. We have our lives to live over. Random clenched her fingers into tiny fists. I don't want this life. I want to be president of the galaxy. Is that too much to ask? The president was gone, and in her place, a tear tearful teenage goth. Guild note. Guide... <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting into... <laughs> something completely different there. Guide note. The goth phenomena is not confined to the planet Earth. Many species choose to define their adolescent periods with sustained truculent silences and the heartfelt belief that their parents took the wrong baby home from the hospital because their natural parents could not possibly be so mind-warpingly dense and boring. While the adolescents of Earth advertise their feelings of isolation by wearing black clothing and listening to rock bands with names like Bloodshock and Sputum, the, the Huluvu, a superintelligent shade of blue, demonstrate their dissatisfaction with the universe by holding their breath until they turn deep purple. Whilst the tubular Zingatularians, deep sea crustaceans, drive their parents demented by literally talking out of their asses. Trillian realised that her daughter was a child once more, and she hugged the girl with something close to ferocity. We have each other again, and Daddy's here too. Trillian's rush of enthusiasm was enough to make her dizzy. All the things that we can do together, camping and getting earrings and stuff, so many protests to march in, you'll love those, down with international conglomerates and all that. The future is yours. You will be galactic president again, I promise. Ford Prefect stepped into the conversation, waving his towel like a peace flag. I <clears throat> I hate to be the one leaving a bag of Slooflinian poo on your dream doorstep, but there may not be time to mount an election campaign for this particular planet. There might not even be time to secure the party nomination. Trillian asked Ford a question she had historically posed at least once per conversation. What the hell are you talking about, Ford? Ford raised his hands high like a preacher. All of this, all of this, it's a construct. Guide note. Throughout recorded history, people have used constructs to avoid reality. The cheapest way to escape despair is to take refuge in one's imagination. During the day, a person might be forced to work in a quimp slattery, but in the evening, that same person can be transformed by sheer force of will and imagination into a rumper of felt sparks. Of course, billions of people have no imaginations, and for these people, there are pangalactic gargle blasters. After two of those babies, the dullest, most both by the book Vogon, will be up on the bar in stilettos, yodeling mountain shankies, and swearing he's the king of grey binding fiefdoms of Saxaquine. Unfortunately, this method of escape from reality only lasts for a couple of weekends, by which time the escapee will be quite dead. Cause of death usually being a rebellious liver packing its bag and exiting the host's torso via the nearest viable exit. 
Because liver desertion is not a nice way to go, most species have invented some form of construct to escape their daily lives. The most primitive constructs are cave paintings. Uh, Unless you are a guild creature, then it is difficult to get the paint to stick. And if you try it on dry land, then the paint will be sticky, but so will your gills. Cave paintings lead to more sophisticated works. Lead to books, first with pictures, then without. Back to pictures with television, onwards to 3D experiences, and finally interactive multisensory holographic constructs. Better than the real thing. In the case of the Flagathon gas swamps, much better than the real thing. The Gassians of Flagathon were so peeved by their name and by the constant stink of Spyrogyra invading their nostrils that they hired the hyper-intelligent Magratheans to build an idyllic construct that would be permanently occupied by every Gassian, except for a rotating staff awakened to service the virtual reality and keep the gas mines pumping. The construct was designed by the Magrathean A-team of doctors Breetlewine, Zestifang and Lassane, who had won a golden lobe for their work on New Asgard. After 50, 15 years, the construct was ready to be plugged in, and was named DBDZDLS in the, name, in, in the team's honour. For years... Things were rosy, all happy snores and money in the bank, until the computer happened to randomly wake up five people who did not have the population's best interests at heart. These people, let's call them assholes, realised that while the cats were indulging themselves in their favourite virtual fantasies, the mice could strip the planet bare and live like les grandes fromages in the real universe. It took them ten years, but the assholes managed to get gut the old planet while the Magratheans were simultaneously building them a new one, a nice Neptune-sized terrestrial world, hold the swamps, slingshot into orbit in the Alpha Centauri system. They named the planet Incognitus, and immediately enforced a worldwide no-extradition rule. Five years later, the Gassians awoke to find their suspended animation diaper bags overflowing and their planet smelling worse than ever. The moral of the story is, there are a few, there are, there are a few actually, there are, sorry, and the moral of the story is, there are a few actually. Some people are bastards and should never be left in charge, and... A Magrathian will always take money, no questions asked. Finally, always fit composting diaper bags, just in case, because you really never know. No one really ever knows. Four minutes, Ford, said Arthur Dent seconds later, feeling confusion and powerlessness appear at his shoulders like two mates from secondary school who were great fun at the time, but now refused to move on like everyone else, and still thought fart cushions were hilarious. That is so bloody typical of this galaxy. I finally get my daughter back, and now you tell me we're all about to be blown to pieces in four bloody minutes. Ford punched his shoulder jovially. No, 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 no. We go back to reality in four minutes. It will take the Grebulons at least 30 minutes to carve up the whole planet with death beams. It will be a lot quicker and more cost-effective with nukes. Ask the Vogons. You wouldn't catch them using death beams. You are wrong, said Ford. Sorry, you are wrong, Ford, said Trillian, pale with worry and anger. I remember, Club Beater. We survived that. Our Babelfish transported us to Milliways. I remember it clearly. Clearly? Do you really? Maybe not clearly, admitted Trillian. It was a long time ago. No, blurted Random. It wasn't Babelfish. It was unicorns. Unicorns, breathed Arthur. And he knew then that Ford was right. The guide Mark II had let them supply their own method of escape. His own had involved uniting all of the Earth's superpowers. Clearly impossible. Yes, Arthur. A squadron of space unicorn rangers came to save us. I remember Sparkle Gem Truehoof. We were pen pals. 
Arthur hurriedly changed the subject before anyone could get started on the unicorn theory. In four minutes, this room will disappear, Ford, will be left facing Grebulon death beams, and you thought it would be a great idea to waste half of that time with your election campaign imagery. I didn't think it was a great idea, said Ford, who didn't get sarcasm unless he really concentrated, which he only did about once a year, usually when he'd had one last chance to press the correct button or the ship exploded. I thought it was an okay idea, on a scale of one to ten, maybe four point five. Ford! Yes, Arthur, old mate. You're doing it again. Wasting time. Shouldn't we be coming up with a plan? Random wiped her tears on a sleeve. She would swallow down the world of hurt and bear up, just as she had always done as president. Hadn't she persevered when the celebratory chef chefs of earth had downed spatulas because of the influx of cheap and flashy, flashy dentrassy labour? Guide note, Dentrassi chefs are extremely foul-mouthed and launch into long tirades even when things are going right, and so make excellent TV chefs. Also because of their time-hop pods, they do not have to prepare one earlier until the end of the show. Had she not forged ahead with the Blagulon Capans, had parachuted 12 million cows into mainland Europe in an attempt to increase the methane content of the atmosphere. Luckily, there were not many vegetarians on that continent and the cows didn't last long, especially since they were a Meglian major cows who literally begged to be eaten. Most of them didn't have to ask twice. Many of them never got to ask once. And quite a few were being flambéed before their parachutes actually hit the ground. I will take control, thought Random, with a determination that actually was beyond her years. She shrugged her mother off. Listen to me, everyone. I have been in tighter spots than this. What we need to do is hook your hitchhiker's guide up to the Grebulon communication system, and I will negotiate with them as future president of the galaxy. Ford patted Random on the head. Hush now, dearie. Grown-ups talking. You palm wrangler, swore Random, most unpresidentially. Thank you very much, said a touched Ford, who'd always been proud of his skin, skill at the palm wrangling pits of Bohoom Lane. But let's do compliments later. Later, said Arthur. What later? We don't have a later, thanks to your Mark II. It's not mine, objected the Beetlejuicean. You stole it, Ford. You posted it to yourself, care of me. And I think that makes it yours. Ah, you see... I stole it, therefore it's not mine. You're winning my argument for me. 237, said the digital readout. 236. Then 10. 9. Hmm, said Ford, scratching the plane in space where his chin was obstinately refusing to be. That's a little strange. I know agreed Arthur. Surely the numerical system hasn't changed. We've only been away a couple of seconds. Well, if the numerical system's been changed, they might not even be seconds. The bird reappeared, its image striated with lines of interference. Sorry, all this arguing is draining my battery. Negative energy. And Mark II disappeared, taking with it the tranquil room of sky. Arthur, Trillian, Random, and Ford found themselves deposited on the men's room's stairs in Stavro Mueller's swanky, until very recently, Club Beta, their memories of virtual lives dissipating like mist in the sunlight. This is real life, Arthur realised. How could I have ever been duped by that beach? How could it have been real when no one was trying to kill me? The air was alive with screaming, the cacophonous wrenching sounds of civilization collapsing, the thrum and buzz of Grebulon death rays, and the chittering of a million rats fleeing the city, which the four arrivees could understand thanks to the Babelfish universal translators in their ear holes. 
"'I saw it in those dog intestines,' squeaked one lady rat named Audrey. "'I foretold the end for the two-footers by, 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 by a big green space light. "'No one would bloody listen. Nobody!' "'Come on, Mum!' Scoffed, scoffed her eighteenth son, Cornelius. "'You said a dark stranger would cross our path. "'Them are dark strangers firing them death beams. "'What do you call them?' Cornelius twitched a whisker, the rat equivalent of rolled eyeballs. "'That's one interpretation. "'You need to be more specific, Mum. "'People are laughing.' "'Cheeky beggar,' said Audrey, "'and scampered off down a drain. "'The rest of the rats said things like, "'Oh, no! Oh, Muriodim, the father of the rat-gods. Arg, Dark stranger, my ass. Arthur Dent sat on the stairs in the midst of the whole imbroglio, feeling strangely peaceful. There was nothing to do but be happy for having loved someone once and having been loved in return. It was big, dying. Big. But not as big as it had once seemed. At the foot of the stairs a sobbing random was being comforted by both Trillian and Trisha Macmillan. Stupid bloody plural zone, thought Arthur. You leave one earth and come back to another. The earth I left was destroyed and the one I returned to has a Trisha Macmillan who never travelled through space with Zaphod Beeblebrox. Ah, the infinite multitudinous possibilities of my home planet, the things I might have seen on another earth, just down the probability axis. I might have made myself a nice cup of tea. Regrets, he sang absently in his mind, have had a few, like all those days spent in detention. Frankie Martin, Jr. What a crooner. The green rays scythed closer now. Arthur could feel the heat burning one side of his face. That's going to peel, he thought. "'Hey, look,' said Ford brightly. "'My blue suede shoes. Fruity!' "'Hold on a sec. I'm going to see how much there is to go before we crack on. "'I think I'm going to call it th a day there, gang, "'because the next chapter is super-duper mega long, uh, "'and it'll keep us going forever. "'So we'll catch up again, same time, same place, next week.' at nine o'clock, <laughs> and I will have solved all possible technological foobars, such as we've had this week, um, and everything will be fruity and hoopy. Yas? Thank you so much for joining me, as always, gang. We will crack on with another thing, and another thing, next week. 2100. One last appeal to you all, lovely listeners, uh, lovely viewers, to go to patreon.com forward slash thebeardedwit and sign up to be a patron to support me in this. Um, and, oh, oh, sorry, there's a comment here from Patrick Dickerson. Hold on. He says, hey, Matthew, thanks so much for the readings. A really cool idea. I'm an American living in Germany for an apprenticeship for stonemasonry. I started listening to your podcast shortly before Christmas last year whilst I was carving for a sculpture. Took a pause during the holidays due to catching COVID. Oh, hope you're better, mate. Uh, oh, mostly better now. I'm hopefully graduating this summer. Can't afford to be a patron just yet, but I'm planning on it later this summer. Thank you. Good man. I don't. If you can't afford it, don't don't feel pressured. But when you can, I would love it. So thank you very much, Patrick. I appreciate that. Um, good to see you here, Mum. Um, sorry, I'm responding to comments on on the Facebook feed over here, just in case people are like, "What the hell is he talking about?" This strange man. But yeah. So if you could, when you can, and you can afford it, and it's it's possible for you, if you can be a patron uh, on Patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, I would be massively grateful. Um, but in the meantime. Thank you very much for listening this week. Um, we will catch up at the same time, same place next week. Um, take care of yourselves. Be good to yourselves. Look after yourselves. Uh, and I will see you in a week's time. Take care, everyone. Bye now.